I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you, happy boys and honey. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck, the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine. Let me see. You're the girl who's going to start school again, aren't you? Yes. My school started a week ago on Monday. Did all the schools all over the country start that Monday? Well, I know a lot of schools that did. But then there are lots of schools, of course, all over the country. And many of them start at different times. Do you suppose my school is one of the first ones to start? I'm sure it was. You're one of the first ones off on the big race to be the best educated girl this year. I am? You are. And you know the secret of winning? Study real hard? That's right. And remember, if there's something you don't understand, just ask your teacher to help you. That's very important. Yes, it is. Because if you don't understand a certain thing, what comes after is going to be very hard to understand. Yes, that's a very important point. How can you ever know how much 3,000 times 755 is if you don't know how much 2 and 2 are? Oh, now you're teasing me. Well, maybe I am, but it's true. <laughs> I suppose it is. Now will you please read me the funny? Puck the Comic yes. Weekly? Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly, and on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, our new comic strip, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. <whistles> toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. <laughs> Every time Beetle Bailey turns around, he seems to stumble into trouble. Today at his army outpost, he's been doing a little batting practice. Up in the air goes the ball. And down it comes, straight into a window. His top sergeant sticks his head through the window and roars, Bailey, I think I'll go stark raving loony if I have to look at you another minute. Come in here. Beetle stumbles into the office. <laughs> He stops in front of the sergeant's second picture top row and salutes. <laughs> the top sergeant writes something on a piece of paper and hands it to Beetle. Take this pass and go into town. Go anywhere, but go! <laughs> a little later, Beetle is in town. He goes to the USO, which is a place where soldiers are entertained in their hours off duty. Last picture top row, he tries a game of pool, takes careful aim at the ball, and then takes a poke at it with a stick. It misses the ball and rips up the cloth on the table, spoiling the game for everybody else. <laughs> I, uh, I guess this just isn't my game. First picture bottom row, he tries a game of darts, but misses the target, and the darts stick in the wall. And then, one of them does a complete curve and ends up in the back of a lady. Beetle exclaims, uh, maybe I better find something else to know. A few minutes later, he's at the refreshment table with a plate loaded with ten donuts and a cup of coffee. The girl at the coffee counter asks him sarcastically if he has enough donuts. He answers, yeah, this is plenty, thanks. He walks over to a chair that a girl is standing in front of, thinking, I'll just sit down here and stay out of trouble. Beetle pulls the chair away just as she starts to sit down. And down the girl goes. Last picture, the door of the top sergeant's office opens, and in walks Beetle. Oops. He salutes again and hands the sergeant the pass. They said you get paid for putting up with me. Oh, no! He gets in so much trouble, but he's really funny. Yes, he is. Especially when he pulled that chair out from under that girl. Well, would you like that to happen to you? No, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't do it to anybody else. Neither would I. Well, now let's go over the page. Oh, yes, and here's Prince Valiant. And he was telling off the story about the time when the Huns... 
Uh, those were those terrible, cruel people who were attacking the castle of Andalcrag, and the people there were the nicest people in the world at that time. Yes, and the leader was Prince Cameron. And for a long, long time, the Huns had been attacking the castle. And finally, they had no food left. And it looked like the moment when the people inside the castle might have to give up. I wonder if they will. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Gray, Mulkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. Val continues to tell his story to young Arf, who writes swiftly as Val tells the tragic fate of Andalcrag. The Hun was master from sea to sea, and only Andalcrag stood above the smoke of ravaged Europe unconquered. Now our food and drink were gone. Gone. All night we carried the vast treasures of Andalcrag and placed them in a vault beneath the floor. At dawn, the work was done. And then, then one by one, the graceful, high-hearted ladies bade farewell to husband, son, or sweetheart and slowly mounted the tower stairway. Last picture, top row. Cameron himself applied the torch that would bring roof and walls crashing down in final ruin. I turned to him, first picture, second row, and cried, But my captain, the ladies, they're still up in the tower. Pointing to the screaming Huns outside, Prince Cameron answered, The ladies don't choose to fall into the hands of those demons. And then last picture, second row, the remnant of that brave band armed themselves and left their flaming home by a secret way. And fearful was the gleaming of their eyes as they went to their last encounter with the honey. A huge boulder blocked the exit of their tunnel, but they threw their weight against it, first picture bottom row, and went leaping out into the sunlight, shouting their battle cries to cut a crimson path through the enemy ranks. And last picture, the sun went down, and in the gathering darkness, I remember standing alone within the flaming circle of my singing song. Oh, isn't that sad? All those wonderful people, they, they fought until they died. Yes, it looks like the only man left alive is Prince Valiant. My, that was a sad story. Yes, it was. But people like Prince Cameron would rather die gloriously than live to be tortured by cruel men like those Huns. Well, next week we'll find out more about the life of Prince Valiant and the story of Thule. Now let's go looking for Robin Hood. Go past the little king... Across page five, past the Lone Ranger, turn over that page, and here he is, Robin Hood. And you remember that Robin Hood was almost caught by that mean sheriff of Nottingham last week? Yes, it was a close shave, but he escaped into the woods, and just when it looked like he might be caught, his men popped out of the bushes and with their arrows sent the sheriff's men flying back. I wonder, does he really get away, though? Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with the story of Robin Hood. It's merry, merry England in days long ago. Time now for Robin Hood. So music, hi-ho! <laughs> Saved by the dramatic arrival of his band, Robin leaves the counter charge against the sheriff's fleeing archers. The sheriff shouts in panic, Disperse! Take cover! In no time at all, the sheriff's men have disappeared, and Robin's happy outlaws gather around Friar Tuck, who now has a bump on his head. Friar Tuck says, third picture, top row. Well, now, Robin, it seems that I am one of you. Robin, looking at the huge friar, laughs. Hey, good friar, you are two of us. <laughs> two years pass. When word reaches London that the King's Crusade has ended in failure with Richard himself held prisoner in Austria for a ransom of 100,000 marks. When the queen learns this news, first picture bottom row with the maid Marion, she hastens to Nottingham to plead for the help of Prince John, who is King Richard's brother. But Prince John doesn't want to help Richard get back because he wants to get the throne for himself. He says to the queen, Why, I am impoverished, trying to protect the realm against that cursed outlaw, Robin Hood. The maid Marion says defiantly that this is not true, that Robin Hood loves the king. John answers, He loves him better in a foreign prison. The Maid Marian asked the Queen to send her to Robin Hood so she can prove Robin's loyalty to the King. The Queen doesn't think she should. But Prince John says, last picture, Well, let her seek out her swain. If the proud Marian has already been nicked by Cupid's darts, what harm can outlaw arrows do? Oh, that cruel Prince John. He won't even help his own brother. No, 
you see, as long as Richard is out of the country, Prince John is in charge of things, and he can tax the people and take that money for himself. And King Richard would never do that because he's good. No, he wouldn't. You think that the Maid Marian will go to see Robin Hood? Well, that's something we'll find out next week. But now I think you'd like to read Donald Duck. Oh, of course I'd like to read Donald Duck because he's my favorite. Well, you'll find him on the last page of the first section, so let's get there right away. And here he is. And here we go with Donald Duck all good for a chuckle. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze, jump, squeeze, jump, squealy, chicken track. Let's have music to better quack, quack. Donald's had his car to the garage for repairs. And after paying the bill, he decides he might be wiser to trade his 1940 model in on a 1942 car. And by the time you can go... (laughs) Donald's at a place where they sell cars. And a salesman is saying, fourth picture, top row. Why, here we are, sir, 1942 job, clean as a whistle. <laughs> ah, uh, does this have the automatic transmission? The salesman points to another car, last picture, top row. And uh, no, uh, that came out on his 1946 model. <laughs> ah, looks better, too. Uh, I suppose it has the twin carburetors and the overdrive. The salesman points to another car, first picture, bottom row. Well, uh, uh, no, those first appeared on this 1947 model over here. Ah, say, not bad. That's a job with 50 more horsepower, too, isn't it? No, 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 that was a 1948. I have one back here. Okay, let's see it. Ah, uh, naturally, this has power steering and push-button windows. Why, uh, no, sir, only the 1952 models have those. And by the time you can go... Last picture, Donald is driving down the street in a brand new, beautiful car, and he says, Boy, what a high pressure artist he was. <laughs> Wasn't that funny? Yeah. Every time Donald asked a question, then he finally had to get a newer car in order to get what he asked about. <laughs> yes, and then he says the salesman high pressured him into buying the car. <laughs> yes, it looks to me like the salesman didn't really have to say anything at all to Donald because Donald really said it all to himself. <laughs> yes, he did. Well, now let's go to the first page of the second section. Oh, yes, and I'll bet you there we'll find that funny Dagwood with Blondie. Wonder what crazy thing Dagwood does today. Well, we'll find out in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ramma foo, ramma fum, zim zam zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood's going to repair his ceiling today. He sets the tub of plaster down on the floor and then climbs the ladder and starts to work. Last picture, top row, Dagwood's daughter, Cookie, and some of her friends are making jelly sandwiches. Cookie says, My daddy's plastering the ceiling. And let's go in and watch him. So the kids drop in to watch Dagwood at work. Dagwood says, first picture, second row. Hey, you kids now, keep away from that tub of plaster before you have an accident. But no sooner has he turned his back than little Elmo starts to cry. Dagwood dashes down the ladder. I knew it. He sees Elmo's sister reaching into the plaster for something. Cookie says, Elmo dropped his jelly bread in the plaster. Oh, for heaven's sake. Now, go on, get upstairs, get upstairs. Dagwood chases the kids upstairs, last picture, second row. A little later, Dagwood is putting the finishing touches to his job. First picture, third row, he says proudly, Ah, there, it's finished, and a perfect job if I do say so myself. And then he calls Blondie and his neighbors, the Woodleys, in. Ah, you thought I couldn't do it. Now come on in and see the finished job. They all troop into the house. Last picture, third row, they stop and stare at the ceiling. Herb exclaims, By golly, you can't even tell where he repaired it. And Tootsie says, Dagwood, you're a genius. And Dagwood smiles proudly. First picture, bottom row, upstairs, the kids are playing a game. They're standing on a bureau, and one of them says, Let's see who can jump the farthest. She leaps off the bureau onto the floor, (laughs) knocking the soft plaster off the ceiling. Smack into the faces of the Woodleys, Dagwood, and Blondie below. 
Last picture, the kids dash down the stairs. They stop in surprise as they see four people covered with plaster from their heads to their shoulders. And Cookie's playmate asks, Hey, who are those people? I don't recognize any of them. <laughs> Yes, Dagwood should have sent the kids to the basement instead of upstairs. Yes, Dagwood should have sent them into the basement instead of upstairs. Well, I bet he will next time. Yes, I bet he will next time. Yes. Well, now look underneath Dagwood and Blondie. There's Big Ben Bolt. Yes, and Ben is in trouble because he had come to a farmhouse to get some gasoline, and he got caught right in the middle of a, a feud between two mountain families, the Hallidays and the Ventures, their names were... Well, they even shot off guns at each other. Yes, and when the Venture's child was hit by a bullet shot by a Halliday, Ben made the Venture stop shooting and stepped out on the porch with a boy in his arms. And that was very dangerous because the Hallidays might have shot Ben. Yes, but they didn't. The leader of the Hallidays told one of his own men to take the boy to the doctor. But he wouldn't let Ben go away. I wonder if that means more trouble for Ben. Well, let's find out right now. Here we go with Big Ben Bolt. Faint and punch and dodge and twist. It's a knockout blow from Big Ben's fist. <laughs> Halliday says to Ben, Well, even if you ain't got no venture blood, you're as bad as one of them. And you being unarmed ain't going to help, because you're meeting up with little David. A giant of a man answers, You calling me, Uncle? Lay aside your rifle, little David. It's not gunfighting I'm wanting you for. The giant walks toward Ben as the old man says, Last picture, top row, You can skidoo now, mister, providing you can first get past David. Wait, aim and it'll let you go far. Before Ben can move, little David clutches him by the back of the neck and begins to shut off Ben's breath. Fighting desperately for breath, Ben sinks his right into little David's stomach. First picture, bottom row. <laughs> you can't do no harm there, mister. And bigger men than you have tried. Half choked to death, Ben lapses into unconsciousness. David shoves him to the ground. <laughs> Old man Halliday says, Pour some water on him, Godfrey. He ain't finished yet. All right, on your feet, mister. Little David ain't hardly showed you nothing yet. Have you, David? Little David leans over Ben and says, No, he ain't even been kicked or twisted yet. Fighting his way back to consciousness, Ben slowly climbs to his feet. He sees little David lift his foot to kick him. Quickly, Ben grabs David's foot <clears throat> and begins to twist it. Last picture, as old man Halliday yells, Look out, David! He's planning to trick you! <laughs> They sit there with their guns so that Ben can't get away, and they let that big giant, who's much bigger than Ben, choke him like that. No, I don't have any time for people like that either. I'm glad that Ben got hold of his foot, and I hope he twists his foot right off. Well, maybe Ben can use some of his good wrestling technique and still whip little David, even though David is much bigger than he is. I hope he does. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. Now, let's turn over the page to Roy Rogers. Yes, and here he is. And you remember last week that Roy had come to that trading post with that guard from the stagecoach? Yes, they had trailed Hairpin Hobbs, who had held up the coach. And the guard went into the store, and Hobbs shot him. Roy, in a quick fight, disarmed Hobbs and told Sam Teal, who owned the trading post, to lock Hobbs up. And then Roy was going to send the guard, who was only wounded, to town. I wonder what happens next. Well, we'll find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, king of the cowboys. Hi yip by oh now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Hi yip by oh The wounded guard has been loaded into a wagon, and Roy is saying to the driver, Now when you reach town with a wounded shotgun guard, you can tell the sheriff, Half in Hobbs shot him. We'll hold him here. Hey, what was that? Roy runs around behind the store and meets Sam Teal, who is carrying his rifle. Teal says cheerfully, Okay, you can hold it, Rogers. Hairpin try to make a break for it, and I had to plug him. Good riddance, say I. Well, I reckon the sheriff will want an explanation, Sam. Well, you tell him what happened then. I'm going down to the river and salvage one of the wheels on that burned stage. Got a hunch I can make a nice lamp fixture out of it. Soon as Teal is gone, Roy, who suspects that Teal might be smuggling gold on the stagecoach, slips into his workshop. First picture, bottom row, he sees a wooden ring on the wall. Yeah, I wonder what that wooden ring is for. Roy gives it a pull. A trap door opens on the floor in front of him. Roy goes down the ladder, leading below. 
He sees a lot of wagon wheels and exclaims, Hey, it looks like Sam's the collector of wagon wheels. But there's a spoke missing from each one. Last picture. Sam Teal gets back to his trading post. He sees the open skylight. He reaches for his rifle and exclaims, Roger's horse! And that skylight propped open. I thought he was smarter than he let on. Well, he won't be for long. Oh, Roy Rogers has discovered that Sam Teal is the one who's been smuggling the gold on the stagecoach, hasn't he? Yes, I think those wagon wheels with the spoke missing has something to do with it. But now that Sam Teal knows that Roy's in there, if Roy doesn't get out of that basement quick, why, Teal may lock him up down in that room, and, and then what might happen... He might even shoot Roy Dad. Well, let's not get too worried. We'll find out more about this next week. Now, let's go over the page to Dick's Adventures. Oh, yes, and I'm anxious to read Dick's Adventures because he's been in the early days of America with General Hull. And, and last week, General Hull had to surrender his fort to the British. That was because the British were at war with the Americans and had thousands of Indians on their side. But I wonder what will happen next in this war between the British and the Americans. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Dick's Adventures in Dreamland. Say the magic words with me. Riggedy pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Dick and his dad have been reading about Oliver Perry, who is a famous American seaman. Dick's getting drowsy. He says to his dad, You know, I guess Oliver Hazard Perry was one of the most famous naval heroes in history, huh, Dad? Why, he wasn't even on the ocean when he... What is greatest battle? Oh, gosh, I'm getting sleepy. Dick falls asleep, and in his mind begins to go back, back, back. He sees himself last picture, top row, on a blustery day in Lebanon, Connecticut, in February 1813. Dick and his good friend, Alex Perry, are listening to Papa Perry, an old Navy man, while Mother Perry fixes supper. The old man goes on... Well, the only way we can recapture Detroit is to find a hard-fisted commander to smash the British fleet off Lake Erie. First picture, second row, the old man goes on. Now, let's see. Uh, who we got in the Navy? There's, there's Rogers, Decatur, St. Clair, Hull, Porter, and every one of them sound, seasoned, saltwater sailors. Yes, sir. Any one of them could do it. Then Alexander Perry speaks up with a small brother's pride. Well, well, what about Oliver, Pa? He's the finest sailor in the United States Navy. And he goes on, last picture, second row. Oliver was a midshipman when he was 15, only two years older than I am now. He was at Tripoli when we knocked the stuffings out of the Barbary Coast Pirates. Oh, if I were President Madison Pa, I bet you I'd appoint Oliver to kick the breeze right off Lake Erie. But first picture, bottom row, Mr. Perry shakes his head. No, no, Ollie's only 27. Too young, much, much, much too young for a job as big as that. No, oh, they won't even think of him. Last picture at that moment, the door swings open, and in steps a tall, good-looking young man in the uniform of the United States Navy. He salutes his dad with a grin and says, At your service, Papa. Lieutenant Oliver Hazard Perry, on orders to report for immediate duty on Lake Erie, to build a fleet of ships and push the British back to where they came from. Yes, especially in that uniform. And even though his father thought he was too young, he's going to be made captain or something of some ship, isn't he? And his job is to clear Lake Erie of the British who are fighting the Americans. Oh, I'm anxious to see that. Well, I'm sure you will in the weeks to come. But now, look, underneath Dick's adventures, there's Rusty Riley, who has been training his coat for that famous horse race. And that's the race where he can win $1,000. And if Rusty wins it, he's going to give the money to Mrs. Jones so that that mean Mr. Marlowe can't take her farm away from her. But Rusty has a problem. His horse isn't running. Right. Yes, Rusty said that the horse was lifting his feet too high, and he said he could never win the race that way. Well, what can he do about it? Well, let's read now and see if he solves the problem. Here we go with Rusty Raleigh. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. As Rusty and Pete are trying to figure out why his horse is lifting its feet in that peculiar manner, a tall, quaint-looking man wearing a stovepipe hat approaches and says, last picture, top row, Ah, oh, my dear young questions, are you the fortunate proprietors of this eye-feeling steed, as handsome a descendant of the great Godolphin as I have ever seen? Huh? I, I, I mean, if, if you mean, is this our horse? Oh, yeah, yes, sir. The man goes on, first picture, bottom row. 
Am I correct in assuming that your presence with that equine beauty upon this circular pathway presages his entry in a contest of speed? Oh, well, if you mean are we going to race him, we got him entered in the Blue Brook Handicap. But, but there's something wrong with his gait. Yes, so I observed as I approached from Yarn Shed, which is my temporary uh, residence. If you will permit a suggestion, I believe we can correct his tendency to indulge in a cakewalk. Cheapers, do you know about horses? Do I know about horses? My friend, you are gazing upon Cedric Wellington Chumley, probably the world's greatest equine expert. Uh, do expedite matters. Uh, just you call me Stovepipe. Why, well, I'm glad to meet you, Mr. Stovepipe. Uh, this is Pete Peters, and I'm Rusty Riley. Uh, wh what do you think is wrong with Space Pilot? Last picture, Stovepipe looks at the horse's hoof and exclaims, Ah, oh, my suspicion is justified. This horse has been shod with a tip shoe for pasture, but it's much too heavy. We must hire us to the village smithy and equip this steed with racing plates. Golly, Mr. Stovepipe, you really do know about horses. <laughs> That nice man has found out what the trouble is. Yes, it does. And if he's right, all they have to do is to change the work shoes on the horse's hoof. And then the horse will handle his feet the way Rusty wants him to, and then the horse will win the race and save Mrs. Jones' farm. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. But now that's all the time I have. Before I go, here's that nice fellow with some interesting information. <laughs> Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Connie Gigi Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you, happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs>